So, my name is Ed. If you don't know me very well, um, I'm 44 years old. I am married. I've been married. It'll be 19 years this August. 18 years this August. Um, that's close. Yeah. Um, I am. I I want to think that I'm self-aware. Uh, have you guys? Do you guys think you're pretty self-aware? Do you, when you think about yourself, do you think, oh yeah, I'm, I'm aware of my strengths and weaknesses, I kind of know who I am. Is that? Yes. Yes. It's good to be self-aware. Just repeat that to yourself. It is good to be self-aware. All right, so let me ask you something. Do you guys have anyone in your life, maybe a friend, uh, it could be a relationship, someone who's kind of high maintenance? Don't say it out loud because it's just rude. Don't be that guy or girl. Like, you have someone in your life and they're like, that person is a high maintenance person. Can you guys... Picture like everyone probably has an idea of what that actually means, and maybe it might be different for everybody. But someone who is a high maintenance person, you guys have that person. Why are you smiling back there, Tammy? <laughs> Listen, I think I think I'm a high maintenance person. <laughs> it's starting to occur to me that I might be. I'm 44. It's just now. Andy, don't smile. Listen, when we walk, Andy and I walk together. He walks three times faster than I do. And we've been all over cities together. And every, I'm telling you, every seven minutes, I say to him, hey, Andy, could you please slow down? <laughs> hey, Andy, Andy, you're walking like a fast stork or something. I can't keep <laughs> up with you. Like, I don't, you got that stride. So I think I'm the high maintenance guy in our friendship. I just want to say I'm sorry. Um, it occurred to me that I'm high maintenance a few, like a week ago, I got a, a group text. And in the group text, my neighbor from across the street, he has a four-year-old daughter. And he put in the group text, hey, let's take all the kids, and there's like three families with kids in the neighborhood, take all the kids to a baseball game at Cooper St or Clipper Stadium, where the Clippers play. And he's going to get tickets for us, and I thought, man, this would be a great thing. He knows I love baseball, he loves baseball, you know, and it'd be cool to get all the kids together and go. It'd be great, right? But then as the group text starts going, I start thinking, hey, like, when are you thinking, where are you thinking about getting seats? And so then it came, and he was like, well, you know, it's probably easier in the lawn. I'm like, well, yeah, the lawn would be better because the girls are going to get bored at some point. They're not going to sit through that many innings. They're going to last three or four innings before they just have to play around, you know. So the lawn would probably be better. But I said, hey, you know, maybe, maybe, um, like, what time of the day are you thinking, you know, for the game? And he says, well, you know, I was thinking probably a day game. I'm like, hey, well, how about, how about a, 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 a night game? You know, let's do one at night. He goes, Ed, you know, my daughter's four. Her bedtime will be after the second inning, and then we have to go home. Like, we have to do a night game. I said, in my text, I could tell he was getting irritated with me because I kept texting back. Like, well, we, I said, there's no shade. In, this, here's the deal. I have a really bad relationship with this guy. That's 93 million miles away. He's been wrecking my life. <laughs> I can't be in the sun for a few minutes before it starts to get unbearable. If I'm in the sun for like a half hour, I'm burning, like burning. If you are like me, you know what I'm talking about. It like rules your life. If I'm in the sun for like two hours, it's a big, big, big problem. We're talking possible like, you know, you're down for a day. Four hours and you're going to the hospital. I mean, this thing is powerful. It's so powerful. It's 93 million miles away. It takes eight minutes for the sunlight to get here. That's how powerful it is. It's like zooming 93 million miles in eight minutes. So when you hit it, like you're hitting past tense sunlight on your, on your arms. It is so large. If this were a gumball machine and you like screwed off the top of the sun, you could put one million Earths inside this thing. Wrap your mind around that. You stand next to the ocean and you think like this. <gasps> as far as you can see, I'm telling you. One million Earths in this little gumball machine here. That's how big and powerful this is. I'm telling you, if you ask me to do your wedding, and it's an outdoor wedding, you must provide a tree or a canopy, or I will not do your wedding. Just know that up front. I realize I'm the high maintenance guy in this relationship. I'm becoming self-aware, okay? So... That said, there's a reason I was thinking about that, because I was thinking the only way, like if you had to describe the sun, and the problem I have with the sun is the brilliance of the sun. The, 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 the light, the heat, everything about it is so magnified, it just comes out at you, and you know, on, it's, it's great, everyone needs it, but for me it becomes a problem because it's so brilliant, and my skin is so pale and delicate. <laughs> but in this series we've been talking about magnificence. 
And we've been trying to come up with words to describe the magnificence of God. And Andy opened up our series and talked about worthy, that God is bigger and better. We've talked about transcendence, unfathomable. Last week, Chris talked about the name of God, which means faithful. How do I come up with a word that's going to describe who God is? And then it hit me, brilliance. Brilliance is a word. The brilliance of God is probably the best word to describe his glory. And so I was wondering, what would happen if you came in contact with the brilliance of God? You know, as a, as a Christian, you know, someone who believes the things of God, what happens when a Christian starts to get, have an encounter with the glory of God? What happens to that person? If you're here and you consider yourself kind of like, man, I'm not sure about this whole deal. I'm just trying to understand the basics. What would happen if you came in contact with an encounter with the glory of God? What would happen to you? And so that's what I want to do. I want to look at an encounter that Moses had with God. And we've been going in this series the last three weeks in, in uh, Exodus 33 and 34. And I want to look at this encounter and see the after effects of the encounter with God. And hopes that it will give us kind of a clue as to what God what, what would happen to us if we came in contact with this brilliant God? So let's pray together and let's open up the word, okay? Um, Lord, I just thank you so much for um, just your brilliance. Lord, the sunlight is a reminder that you must be so much more. And even on a day like this, as cold as it is, that we see the sun shining to the point I have to wear sunglasses just coming you know, down here this morning because you're so brilliant, God. Give us a glimpse of that today. Teach us what it would be like to encounter you and encounter your glory. In your son's holy name. Amen. Listen, if you have a Bible, open up to Exodus chapter 34. We're going to look at this today. But also, I want you to grab your little blue card out of the bulletin. Here's what I want you to do, if you guys can help me out with something. Put your name on the front of that. And as, I, as I'm communicating today, if there's something that really sticks out in your mind that seems important to you, I want you to write it down. This is your way to kind of give me feedback as to what I'm talking about today. And it also gave me kind of a way to kind of pray for you over the next week or so. And my hope and my prayer has been, and I know our whole staff's been praying, that God would reveal himself to us. So, you know, have your little card, write your name on the front, and on the back just kind of maybe take a note or two. Here's the thing. There's, there's three things I want to share about the passage that we're going to look at. The first one is the glory of God is his brilliance. The glory of God is his brilliance. The, defined, brilliance is great brightness, splendor, elegance. Or magnificence. Brilliance means great brightness, splendor, elegance, or magnificence. Now here's the deal. If we go back in the last couple weeks that we've been studying this passage, then we know that what happened was the Israelites were brought up out of Egypt, and they were out in the desert, and God had ascended into, onto Mount Sinai, and he was basically going to God. God gave the law to him. He comes down. The Israelites are going crazy. Then, you know, there's this big thing going on, and then Moses interacts with God. And God keeps telling Moses, I'm pleased with you. I'm pleased with you. I'm going to go with you. And then Moses, who at this point had only really seen God kind of enveloped in a shroud, he gets bold and he asks this question. In 33, verse 18, it says this. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. Now show me your glory. Some, um, some depictions of this would say, show me your face. So in essence, in a lot of ways, to see God's face is to see his glory. Imagine, you know, you meet someone from a distance and you're thinking, you know, hey, I wonder what that person looks like. And then they turn around and you see their face. In essence, you kind of see who they are. I have a friend who was a guy who had really long blonde hair. He said that all the time trucks would go by and beep at him. And he would think, man, when they saw my face, I wonder if they were thinking, you know. He was a very, very handsome woman, that's all I would say. <laughs> Nevertheless, there's something about the face that means so much to us. And so Moses is saying, will you show me your face? Will you show me your glory? And so then we know from what Chris was saying last week, God said, here's the deal, Moses. I like you. I got a big plan for your life. I can't show you who I am because if I do, you're going to die. You're not made for that. You know, if you think the sun is really bright, you can't, you know, just go and meet up with, with God. That's not how it works. What I will do for you, Moses, I'm going to stick you, there's like this cave. And I'm going to stick you kind of in between the rocks. And I'll put my hand over you, and I'll just kind of walk by you. But when I walk by you, I'm going to share my name with you. That's a big deal. And so he, he does, and he does all that, and he shares his name. And that's where he starts to reveal more of himself to Moses. And then Moses goes, and he talks to Israelites afterward. And here's what happens in 34, verse 29. 
when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. His face was radiant. This is what I love about Scripture. You see these little notes in Scripture and you're like, what? Have you thought about it? Moses comes down from meeting with God. His face is like Ed Travers on, you know, serious sunburn, only glowing. Can you imagine? So Moses goes up to meet with God. God's revealing the law to him. And he's going to come down and reveal the law, everything God's revealed. But when he comes down, he doesn't even, he's not even aware of it. He's like, hey. What is it about the brilliance of God that would actually stain the face of Moses? That would make him glow, would make him beam? You know, the thing about the sun is our sun is actually a dwarf star. It's a dwarf star. Now, when you are out on like a great night and you're looking up into the sky and you're seeing all these stars, you're not seeing a lot of dwarf stars. You're seeing really big stars. Our star is one of the smaller ones. The largest star is this guy. This is Canis Majoris. This little light here, that little tiny little speck, that's our sun. If the gumball machine that is Canis Majoris, if you unscrewed the gumball machine and stuck our sun inside Canis Majoris, Guess how many of our little gumball sums would fit in that big Canis Majoris? Any idea? One billion. One billion. Wrap your mind around that just for a second. Wrap your mind. One billion gumball sums, sums in this big daddy Canis Majoris. But do you know, as powerful as the suns can be, these stars that God has made, and in the Word says that He knows every one of them by name. He made them for a purpose, to show the magnificence of who He is. Do you know that in the future, when God takes us to His city, in Revelation 21, 23, it says this, The city of God, the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the lamp is its lamp. The brilliance of God is what shines in heaven. What shines in the new Jerusalem, the new place where we will live? We don't need a star. Because the brilliance of God is all that we need. That's how much more powerful God is. If you can make something a billion times larger than our sun, then what does that say about you? And here's the deal. When Moses had an encounter with God, his face became radiant. And that brings me to the second point I want to share. is that Moses radiated the brilliance of God. It's interesting what this passage says next, because here's what's happening. He comes down off the mountain, and they're all freaked out because Moses is glowing. Here's what happens in, in verse 30, in Exodus 34. Now, when Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. Which, that sounds about right. Like, what happened to you, Moses? Like, you're, you're kind of freaking me out. But Moses called to them, and so Aaron and all the leaders in the community came back to him, and he spoke to them. And afterward, all the Israelites came near him, and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. If we go back into the last, or to the early part of this chapter, what God had been revealing to Moses was the law. So the Ten Commandments. This, the law was like a, the picture, a promise of the old covenant that God had made with Israel. He said, I want a nation that well, the whole world will know who I am by this nation. So the Israelites were supposed to be on the earth, and if they kept the commands of God then God would bless them, and then all the people on the earth would go, wow, who is the God of that people? That was the plan. But the law also came that you would understand the righteousness of God, that God is a very holy God. And so that's what the law was intended for, that people would understand who God was, and also the rest of the people in the world would understand who God was by these people who followed this righteous God. Now afterward, all the Israelites came near him, and he gave them the commands the Lord had given them on Mount Sinai, verse 33. Now when Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever they entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out, he told the Israelites what had been commanded. They saw his face was radiant, and then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went back to speak with the Lord. Look, it was extremely evident to everyone else that Moses was now different. Moses goes in to talk to God. He comes out, and Moses is different. Everyone knew it. There was no, I mean, he had to put a veil over his face. You know, there wasn't like, hey, I wonder if he's different. I wonder what happened when he met. No, no, no. He was stained with the brilliance of God. And he brought them the law. And the law was a very important thing. But here's the deal. The law will never make you shine. The law will never make you glow with the brilliance of God. 
a lot of people, I think the Israelites were thinking, you know, here, we're going to keep the law so we don't make this God mad. And this will set us apart from the other nations, yes. But they will not glow. That's the fault with the law. And a lot of times, even Christians, we start to think in our minds, man, if I could just behave better, if I could act better, then God will be happy with me. And you know what? You, it's, it's a great thing to follow the commands of God. Like, you should never be like, oh, I'm not going to follow the commands of God. No, 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 no. Follow the commands of God. They're, they're for your protection. They're for you to understand the righteousness of God. But here's the deal. You're going to fail. You are made to be righteous. One of the reasons the law came is so that you would realize that you can't keep the law. Therefore, you need God. And then when you go to God because you need God, you start to encounter God. And when you encounter God, it changes you forever. Moses radiated the brilliance and the glory of God because he encountered God. He brought the law as a sign of the covenant, but it was a weak and less glorious covenant. The thing is, anyone who I've met in my life who's encountered the glory of God has been changed. Everyone. I, have, I can give you a hundred examples. It's real easy to see someone who wasn't a believer that became a believer because it's so easy to see the difference. I've talked about the story about my brother who was an alcoholic. And, you know, I try to explain to people that we're really talking, like, my brother, who was an alcoholic for 10 years, gave his life to Christ. I saw him 30 days clean, and he looked different. And I tried to explain to people, it was almost like his face was glowing. What do you mean? I don't know how to explain it. It was like his countenance had changed. He was glowing. You know, that's the best I can say. A better example for you guys might be my friend Jenny Lee. Uh, Jenny Lee was here at, you know, at New Life when she came to, uh, you know, how to say, as a freshman. Those of you who have been around a long time, you know Jenny. Or if you went on the New York trip last year, I think you got a chance to meet Jenny Lee. Jenny glows. She glows. Let me explain. She, came, she grew up in Central Ohio. She came down to, you know, to OSU, and she got hooked up to New Life. When I first met her, she just seemed like normal Jenny Lee. I'm like, oh, wait. I mean, and she seemed great. I mean, but I, you know, I didn't really know her that well, but she just seemed kind of Jenny Lee. Something happened to her. I don't know what it was. I would love to think that maybe, you know, she had this revelation of God or she saw the brains of God. I don't know what happened to her, but I do know this. She said she wanted to get baptized. And now here, we don't baptize people unless we know they have, they understood the gospel. The gospel. That God made us to be in a relationship with him, but we can't keep the law. God has this law because he's holy, he's righteous. We can't keep it because we all mess it up. We're all imperfect. We're all sinful. And now, because we're not perfect, we're kind of apart from God. We're separated. So God's like, we got a problem here. And we, when we realize that, we're like, yeah, I think I got the problem. God sends his son down, dies on a cross, and says, I'll come, I'll be like one of you. Emmanuel, God with us, comes down, lives the life so that we can identify with God, because he's a man now. And he dies on the cross and raises again. And it's like, God's And when we realize that, that's the gospel. We realize the good news that God came to save us so that we could be in a right relationship with God. We can connect to him again, even though we're not perfect. That's the beauty of the gospel. Somehow, Jenny started to understand that. She goes, I want to get baptized. Now, baptism back then, listen, if you've been here for one of our baptisms, you know we go to the Neal Avenue Baptist Church. Why? Because they have a baptistry built into the church, and we can dunk you in there. Some of you guys have been dunked in that pool, right? Listen, back in the day, we had no relationship with the Neal Avenue Baptist Church. We didn't know who they were. They didn't know who we were. We had to bring in a portable baptistry. So I want you to imagine Campbell Hall. All right? You know the big room, 201? There, up on the stage? We would bring in what looked like a portable hot tub, and we would set it up. It took like two hours to set up, and then we would put this liner in it, and we had this glass thing around it so that the water wouldn't splash up. Because here's the deal. It was also on stage with all of the electrical equipment, which I kept waiting. You know, if anyone's going to die during a baptism, I mean, isn't that the best way to go out? Well, you know, I didn't know what the legalities were, so we have an insurance policy. Anyway, so we would we'd put tape over the outlets. <laughs> that was our big, this is going to work, man, trust me. Anyway, so we built this portable baptistry in Cable Hall. It was great. And then people would get up right before they get baptized, and they would tell the story of how they encountered God, how they encountered the gospel. Jenny, when she spoke, she's this little five-foot-one girl, maybe five-two. And she just looked like the largest person I've ever seen because she freaking looked like she was growing. She just, man. From that point forward, and I knew her for four years while she was at Iowa State, she was a music major. She would help play music sometimes in her band. She ended up serving on my staff as a servant, which means lots of meetings and lots of servanthood, stuff like that. She would bake for people. She was the kind of person that would bring, like, she's Hasegawa in, like, in life. She would bring cupcakes and cakes to things and cookies because she was just a servant like that. She led Bible studies. 
She did all this as a music major, and back then we were on the quarter system. I think full time was maybe 16 hours. Is that about right? She never took less than like 21 or 22. She met with people. She led Bible studies. She did everything we. She did more than we ever asked her to do. But here's the thing: in four years, I tell you, I never heard her complain about busy. How busy she was, never. Because she did everything like she was glowing. People looked at her and they knew there was something different about Jenny. It was easy for me to see because I saw her before, but everyone knew there was something about Jenny. That's the beauty. When you come in contact with the glory of God, it just changes you forever. It really does. Lastly, I just want to say this, that God actually has a plan to radiate his brilliance. God has thought this up. This wasn't like, oh, I know how I can let people see my glory without sticking them in a rock. I mean, wouldn't that be great? Like, let's say you're saying to yourself, you know, uh, I want to see God like that. And God's like going to stuck you between the two, you know, towers. Like maybe, you know, where the hill is right there between the towers down there, and he'll stick you down there, and then like he'll stick his hand over you and pass between the towers. The problem is he'd probably burn all the other people in the towers. So, you know, they're all dead, but hey, you've got to see a little bit. That's great, you know? I mean, that could be the plan. Wouldn't that be awesome if you could see God like that? But God has a better plan than that. He actually has a better plan than that. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, it's going to be up on screen. Let me, let me just read this to you and kind of walk you through this passage. This is now talking about a new covenant. A covenant means promise. Before, God gave a promise to Israelites. Here's my law. You keep my law and I'm going to bless you. You turn away from me, worship other gods, it's bad for you. And that's exactly, if you look at the history of Israel, that's exactly what happened. But in this promise, the promise is, look, I know you can't keep your promise. I know you can't keep up your end of the bargain. But if you will have your faith in me and what my son has done on the cross, by him rising from the dead, you can be in relationship with me. That's the new covenant, a new promise. And here's what he's saying on the other end of that. Not only, yes, I'm going to have you in eternity in heaven. Here's what he says. Verse 7, now this ministry that brought death, talk about this old covenant, which was engraved in letters on stone, the Ten Commandments, came with glory, yes, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was. Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. So what he's saying is, look, you might think Moses had an advantage. You might think Moses walking around with a glowing face would have been a, a big deal. But I'm telling you, it's nothing in comparison to what God has planned. And if that which was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Verse 12. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the Old Testament is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the gospel... When anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. God's plan is so much better than that old plan. This is what He's planning on doing with you and with me. This is the plan. He wants you to know Him. He comes after you by putting His Son down here and says, I'll know what I can do. I can show them. They don't have to see some miraculous sign. I'll raise from the dead. Wow. And He comes after you. And if when you see that moment, the Spirit of God comes in you. That's what it means to become born again. He puts His Spirit in you, and somehow He starts to transform you from the inside out. And then He radiates His brilliance through you. The plan of God is to radiate his brilliance in the world through us. That's the plan. You know, the interesting thing, when, when Jesus came, the night before he, he died, his guys, he had these like 12 guys, right? 12 apostles. One of the guys' names was Philip. And Jesus telling the story about how he's going to die, you know? And Philip's like, ah. Jesus says, I'm going to go to the Father now. And Philip says, what well, I think any one of us in this room would have said, will you show us the way to the Father? And Jesus says, look, don't you know me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We can now look into the character of Christ. We can know him. And in that, we can have the brilliance of God living inside of us. That's the plan. This past weekend, we... Uh, 
had the vision gatherings. And many of you guys have been through the vision gatherings. They're amazing. Uh, it's kind of like our DNA as a church, right? Um, I asked some people, I said, hey, listen, you know, our plan as, as a church is this, that we believe that everyone should thrive. That when we connect to the source of life, it's just going to, our life will be in bloom. It'll, it'll multiply. It, it's, it's incredible what happens when we connect to the source. And our goal is that everyone on the campus would connect to the source. That's the plan. And the plan is that we would influence the campus by being carriers of this source of life so that they would thrive too. But imagine, let's say Darlene, I was telling her this at, you know, at, at the vision gathering, I'm like, well, imagine you've got this friend, your friend in the dorm, or your friend on campus, your friend at work, whatever, your friend's name is, you know, Sally, okay? And I said, Darlene, you know, if you're walking on, you know, and, and you're talking to Sally and say, Sally, you know, what would it take for you to believe in God? And Sally says, well, I suppose if the clouds all lined up and says, I am here, that would probably help. And I said, Darlene, could you imagine the clouds all of a sudden, like, line up, I am here. Sally, <laughs> with an exclamation point. Do you think that would help? Don't you guys think that would be a pretty good plan? Like, what if, you know, one of those guys, I've had a guy literally tell me, if God came down and danced on the table, I think I'd become a believer. I'm like, I think maybe you would. I don't know. I mean, it might help. I think it would help me right now if you would dance on the table so that I could show this guy that you're real. That might help. That's not the plan. You see, God has done miracles. He's already sent his son. He's already made the universe. He's made Canis Majoris. He's made our son. We're in this perfect alignment to have life. The plan now is that you would radiate the brilliance of God by being transformed in his likeness. There is nothing more powerful than one of his believers who comes in contact with the glory of God and starts to become transformed into the likeness of Christ. The old law doesn't work. You being a behaviorist, like, well, I'm just going to behave better than everyone else. Let me tell you what that produces. You will just think you're better than people because you're more disciplined than they are. You will look down on people who can't keep up their end of the bargain like you can. That doesn't work. But encountering the glory of God will transform you. And people will start wondering about you. Why you act the way you do. Why you love the way you do. Why you care the way you do. That is the plan. And I'm not going to argue with God. Evidently, this plan works a lot better than you know, clouds and dancing. So what would happen if you encountered the brilliance of God? I mean, what would happen? Um, you know, if you're, here's the thing, if you're a believer, sometimes, you, you know, if you're like me, that there are times when you just feel like, I've connected to God, and then for a while it seems like I'm not connecting to God. You ever felt like that? And so how do I encounter God, the glory of God again? Or if you're here and you're like, you know, this is all new to me. I don't know how to encounter God at all. And how do I encounter God? And what would happen to me if I did? I'll tell you, it's, it's a pretty simple process. God has not made this hard for us to follow. Here's what he wants for us, okay? This is the simple process. Number one, he's already communicated his word to us. We start to, start to read, start to understand his book. Start to understand his letter to us. That's the number one process. Yesterday, uh, we were sitting down in the living room, and Tammy, she's all excited about it. She's been reading through uh, Judges, and she's been reading this, like, credit. And every day she's coming back to me, she goes, do you know what it says this? I'm like, hey, that's pretty cool. And she's telling me what I'm like, yeah, yeah, and we're born. Yesterday she came to me, and she read the story of Samson, and when, before Samson was born. She read something to me that blew my mind. I almost started crying when she was telling me, but I didn't, I didn't want to cry for my kids because I thought it would be really awkward. So I'm like, she's telling me, I'm like, this is a sermon. I can't even tell you right now, but maybe read it at a time if you guys want to, but seriously, it is so amazing. It blew my mind. The Word of God, it's so amazing. Sometimes in the Word, what will happen is you'll start to get a, a light bulb moment. That's the Holy Spirit trying to illuminate what God has said. God wants to speak to you. There's nothing more powerful. If you want to encounter God, you must pray. Because prayer is an act of faith where you're saying, God, I'm going to trust that you're hearing me. And sometimes in those moments of prayer, like you sense that God is meeting with you. Sometimes you don't feel anything, but then sometimes God will answer a prayer and you'll realize God lined it up. There's nothing more powerful than God answering a prayer. Most importantly, I think obedience is the biggest deal, that when you sense that God is leading you to do something and you obey, God somehow meets you in that moment when you have to have faith that he's going to help you carry out the obedience. And in all of these things, and there's many other ways, and all of these things, well, here's what happens. Sometimes dramatically and sometimes slowly, God starts to transform you 
Transform your character. Transform who you are to become more and more like his son. That's the ministry of the Spirit of God. And if you want to encounter God, you simply go back to God and say, God, teach me what you're trying to say to me. God, I trust in you and pray to him. God, please help me and I will follow you. And in those moments, God will meet you. That's what I would say. If it's for the first time, here's what I would say to you. The very first time, I had this friend who uh, 10 years ago, Tammy and I, uh, we had just we started a Bible study on campus, okay? It was pre-New Life Church, okay? It was just a just a Bible study. There were like six students. It was it was great, you know? We were humble beginnings. Well, there was this girl who came to the Bible study. Her name was Amanda. Super nice girl. Um, I thought she was a Christian because who comes to a Bible study, right? I mean, only Christians show up at Bible studies. And, you know, I'm like, she's great. So we took her to breakfast one morning, and I started asking her about her life. It turns out she grew up in a Jewish Catholic home, so two different parents. Well, they both trained her to do the same things, like on different ends. So she's kind of getting one half one, one half the other, and she's kind of a little bit confused, as you can imagine. She kind of understands what they're all about, but deep down, she's like, I'm not sure which religion to be. They all both seem great to me. That's kind of a main story. Well, what happened was she had this friend who's, like, different. This friend who is unified. I mean, like, just blows, right? So this girl invites Amanda to start doing a Bible study with her her senior year, or right after her senior year, before Ohio State happens, okay? So she starts hearing the Bible and kind of connecting to this girl who she admires, and this starts happening. By the time she shows up in the fall of her freshman year, and we meet her, she's like, well, I want whatever that girl had, so she just showed up to the Bible study. I had no idea. I just assumed she knew Jesus. So we're sitting there at breakfast that morning, I'm asking her about, you know, steps she's taking. I said, well, have you been baptized? She says, no, I haven't been baptized. She goes, you know, I, I, I'm thinking about it. I'm like, well, well, what would stop you from being baptized? She goes, well, I feel like I need to do a, some more stuff first. I said, you mean like what? She goes, and she started making a list of things. You guys, you guys are probably all have a list of things. This is what it would take to impress God. Like, I need to stop doing this. I need to do some of this. You know, you guys, some of you guys have like a scroll because you're like a rule, rule keeper person. Some of you guys are like me. You're like, I got like two things. Like, hey, here's the deal. I look at her and I said, Where'd you get that? She's like, I don't know. I just feel like I should. I said, well, did you read that in the Bible somewhere that you need to do these things to, like, follow God in baptism? Because baptism doesn't make you more holy. Baptism simply is a, it's kind of the symbol of uh, what's already happened in your heart. I get baptized because God said, hey, get baptized. But it's a way for me to proclaim to everyone that I follow Jesus. That's all it is. You go into the water. You're dying to yourself, going down in the water. The water represents the blood of Christ, washes you clean. You come out new as a new creation in Christ. It's just a symbol. None of that makes you a better Christian. It doesn't even get you in heaven. It's just a symbol. But God commands it because he wants us to publicly proclaim that God has infiltrated our heart. So I'm asking her, I said, what would stop you? She said, this, 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 this. I'm like, well, does God say any of that? She's like, no. I said, well, who are you going to trust? Are you going to trust like your intuition? Or are you going to look at what God actually says? She goes, I should probably trust God. I'm like, well, that's a great idea. You should just respond to what God's already said. So she's like, okay. Unless she goes, what should I do? I said, have you given your life to Christ? She goes, I don't know what that is. So I just explained, here's what it means to give your life to Christ. You say to God, God, I'm sorry. I'm the one who's the problem here. I'm the one who's sinned. I'm asking you to forgive me. I believe in what you've done on the cross. I believe in Jesus. I believe he rose from the dead. I want to give my life to him. Would you please come in my life? I said, that's what you do. So we sat in the back of my Honda Prelude back then. It was a little tiny car. She was squinching in the back. And we're just outside breakfast, just in the and we're like, you want to pray? She says, I want to pray. And let me tell you something. I watched that girl change. I watched God transform her more and more every semester, every year. I got to watch her become a leader in our church, influence other people on the campus. She made a difference on her campus. Why? Because she's really bright? She was really bright. But no, something happened to her. She responded. And if you're at that like, first step, that's what you do. You simply respond to the gospel by saying, God, I'll give you my life. If you're like me and that's been a long time ago, what you do is you respond to the gospel again by saying, God, help me connect to you. Teach me through your word. Teach me through prayer. Teach me by Help me to encounter your brilliance. I want to shine. God, make me shine. So that's what I want to share with you. And I, I just ask you a couple things. In what way have you been encountering God lately? And maybe that's what you should write on your, on your card. So grab your card or maybe wherever you're at. I just want you to think about for a moment as we kind of wrap up, you know, what is it that's been happening in you lately? Where are you at with God? What's been happening? Do you feel like you're really distant from God right now? Maybe write that on your card. If you feel like you've been really connecting to God, then maybe that's a time to praise God. You know, and I want you to praise God on my behalf that he's been helping me encounter him. If you're here and it's, it's new to you, then maybe the time for you is to simply say yes to God. 
So what I'm going to ask is that, um, you know, everyone bow their head and let's pray. And for some of you who are still writing, go ahead and do that. But I just want to lead you guys in a prayer that uh, God will help us to encounter his brilliance so that we will radiate the glory of God. <clears throat> if you're like me, and there are just times when you feel distant from God, if you're like me, just talk to God right now and tell him. Just tell him where you're at. Tell him what you're feeling. God, I pray for those like me that just sometimes we seem to either not read our Bible or when we do, we seem to gloss over it. God, sometimes prayer can become more of a chore than more of a delight. And sometimes we're not even obedient because we're not listening. God, I pray that you would stir something in our heart now and even this week. God, help us to connect to you. 